Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, I don't know how I follow the main man. Um, I think that was a really inspiring uh, presentation from Ken and Ryan. Um, I was pleased to accept the invitation from Sam because Sam has done some work with the Care Inspector uh, along with a colleague in relation to encouraging us to think about how we can develop an approach that is more focused on, on personal outcomes. Um, so I felt it was only appropriate that I accepted this offer. Um, my name is Gordon Patterson, so I'm a Chief Inspector in the Care Inspector. The Care Inspector is an organisation that um, inspects and registers care services in Scotland and, and social work services. Um, we register and inspect about 14,000 services that provide care and support to uh, everyone at all ages, I suppose. Um, we also carry out inspections of, of social work in Scotland and jointly with Healthcare Improvement Scotland we inspect um, the work of health and social care partnerships. We have recently concluded um, a number of inspections around local authorities' delivery in relation to adult support and protection and, and this year we're looking at five areas uh, in relation to their provision of, of self-directed support. So we're really interested to see what findings that comes up with, uh, how that can inform developments around self-directed support and how it can hopefully begin to showcase some examples of good practice rather than confirm some of the more negative findings that previous reports have identified. Um, today though I'm, I suppose, uh, I need to qualify the fact that I'm today speaking about the new health and care standards that the Scottish Government published uh, in July last year. Um, I need to stress that these are the government standards. Uh, they are for our consideration as a regulator, as well as for the consideration of anyone who is in and around health and social care in Scotland. Um, they're somewhat different to the standards that came before, and I suppose the contention is that they are based on human rights, and what I'm going to do is tell you a bit about the standards, uh, and a bit about how they maybe contrast to the previous standards that we had, which maybe echoes some of Kenny's experiences in terms of the service that he previously had and, and the life he now has. Um, so these were launched by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sports, Shona Robson, in, in July last year. Uh, and, as I say, they are designed around um, a human rights-based approach. The first standards that were published when our predecessor body, the Care Commission and, and Social Work Inspection Agency were, 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 brought, were, were created, um, were published in 2002 and the standards that have subsequently been released are, are really quite different from that. Previously there were 23 separate s standards for different settings, so care homes for older people had a set of standards, care homes for adults had a set of standards, care at home, housing support, foster care, child mind, all had different standards. There were 2,000 statements, over 2,000 statements and they were mostly about inputs. And the standards at that time only applied to services that were registered with the Care Commission um, and they were used for inspection. That probably needs to be contrasted with what's been developed. And the task that was given to the Care Inspector along with Healthcare Improvement Scotland in 2015 was to change our approach to develop a single set of national standards. A set of standards that were based around overarching principles that were developed by and with people who were experiencing... Oh, sorry. There you go. That was my fault rather than anyone else's. Um, a single set of standards designed around the principles, developed by people experiencing providing care, and designed to be future-proof. Initially, the group that embarked upon this task set out the, the, the principles that the standards were going to be, the overarching principles that the standards sat below. These were the products of quite extensive consultation and they were published um, round about December 2016. Dignity and respect, compassion, responsive care support, well-being and, and inclusion. So these were the principles that were designed, co-produced, a product of consultation and agreed as the overarching principles that supported the standards. There was a lot of discussion about that time, about whether safety should feature in there. Um, it was concluded that that wasn't necessary actually, because some of the people who were part of the group that were designing the standards 
highlighted the fact that safety is what I'm told needs to happen to deny me to do the opportunity to do the things I want to do. People talk about keeping me safe in order to prevent me from taking risks. So it was decided that safety wouldn't feature, but aspects of safety are picked up under the, the well-being um, principle. So beyond the development of the principles, there was a further piece of work done um, engaging with various groups involving the CCPS and Scottish Care, COSLA, uh, engaging with people who, who use and experience services, carers, uh, and, and, and with the sector. And as a consequence of that, last July, the five standards were published. So the five general standards are about IXP and high quality care support that's right for me. I'm fully involved in all decisions about my care and support. I have confidence in the people who provide it and confidence in the organisation who delivers it. And if it's a setting based service, I experience a high quality environment in the, in the organisation. So part of the difference around these standards is that they began to be featuring, uh, they, were, they, they were written in the first person, so they were about people's entitlement, people's experience, what people should reasonably be uh, able to experience in relation to care and support services and health services critically. So what's been launched is a set of standards. I'll leave some on your table so we have the networking break. Um, there are now five standards, and below that there are 146 statements. I'm going to show you some of the statements to illustrate and contrast how they differ from where we were in 2002. Um, and I think that begins to evidence some of the shifts that have been made. It, it begs questions about where we were in 2002, and, and uh, we need to think about that. These standards have to be implemented from the 1st of April this year. Um, they don't just apply to registered care services. They apply to health and social care. So they apply to all services that are delivered in the context of health and social care, including planning, including commissioning, which is a challenge, an opportunity. Um, and they, they, they reach far beyond the, the previous standards. The ambition of the standards is that they are, they are human rights based. They talk about people's entitlement, they define the quality and expectations of services that people should, should be able to receive. They're very much about being person-led, the person's at the centre, they're all written in the first person. Um, they stake a claim for what people should be entitled to. They're outcomes focused, so um, the previous standards were very much about inputs, so they were about processes, they were about outputs, so they were about productivity, they were about numbers, they were about tasks, they were about activities. These standards aim to be much more about outcomes. What impact? does an intervention and engagement with services have for someone? What difference does it make to their life? And they're, they're decoupled from settings. So there's only one set of standards. They aren't specific to different types of registered services. The differences, some of the differences between the standards of 2002 and those that have more recently been published are, they now dis the previous standards used to describe a, a minimum standard, what a service needs to do to meet, this, meet the minimum. The new standards begin to articulate much more about the quality which individuals should experience in, in terms of services and support, health and social care services. Some of the following slides illustrate that quite starkly. So in 2002, the standards said, staff will treat you politely. Staff will call you by your preferred name or title. If you need help, your request will be dealt with politely and as soon as possible. We were in 2002 that that was acceptable or, or even aspirational. That's maybe a too controversial point. I shall disassociate myself. Nobody tweet that one, please. Um, but isn't, isn't it telling us something about where we were in 2002 that the government published standards that said people should be treated in a way that is polite and people should be called the name that they want to be called? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and yeah, I mean, I think that's where the standards begin to take us. So these new standards don't just say 
we'll talk about you according to the name that you prefer and, and we'll be polite. They say things like, I get the most out of life because the people in organisations support and care for me have an enabling attitude and believe in my potential. I experience warmth, kindness and compassion in how I'm supported and cared for, including physical comfort when appropriate. I experience care and support where all people are respected and valued. So we can see the shift in, in illustrating the fact that we're talking here about being treated the way we would like, treating other people the way we would like to be treated ourselves. Another example then is, I suppose, around this outcomes focus. The standards in 2002 said you have full information on your legal position about your occupancy rights in a care home, you're confident the home is run in line with legal requirements for health and safety, fire safety and food hygiene. So that was 2002. We were all in centres, used to see what I was going to say in 2013. Um, there is a shift. There's a deliberate shift. There's, there's an ambitious, um, there's an aspiration about these standards. I'm accepted and valued, whatever my needs, ability, gender, age, faith, mental health. My human rights are protected and promoted and I experience no discrimination. If my independence, control and choice are restricted, this complies with legislation and any restrictions are kept to a minimum. So we can see there that the ambition of the new standards is far greater than that was previously had. It's about rights, it's about entitlement, it's about the person at the centre. You used to be able to ask for copies of the care home's policies. I didn't say you would get them, but you could ask for them. You can ask for confirmation. So this is people living in a care home, that the, the care home meets with uh, all the relevant legislation. So that was the standard in 2002. It says something some, somewhat different now. I am empowered and enabled to be as independent and as in control of my life as I want to be. I am supported to understand and uphold my rights. My human rights are central. And if things go wrong, I receive an apology. And, uh, my human rights are not re respected. The organisation takes responsibility. So we can see the shift, we can see the ambition of these standards, we can see how they're based around entitlement and, and they articulate um, people's human rights. I'll list copies of standards out for you. Um, they describe the quality of care that people should experience. Leslie's not waving at me yet, but I'm going to finish soon because um, I've got some other slides, but I think they're probably less relevant and I'll explain why. So these new health and care standards reach across early learning, child care, social care, um, community justice and, and children's services. They're not just about those services that are provided to people, uh, health and social care services. They, they, they do apply, they should apply, they will apply, we will insist that they apply to planning, to assessment, commissioning and service delivery. We have a challenge about how we insist and demand and, and uh, apply scrutiny to ensure that um, those who are commissioning services are concerned with outcomes rather than time and task and budgets. But the standards provide the leverage for us to do that. They demand that of us. And in relation to the work of the care inspectorate, so we've got to take the standards into account uh, when we're making any decisions. The remain, remaining slides I've got are really about what we are doing. Um, in developing our new methodology to think about people's experience, to think about outcomes, to think about human rights. The standards have um, a number of particular statements and, and some of that is, is about acknowledging citizenship rather than defining people according to what they lack or being deficit and taking a deficit based approach. The standards talk a lot about community connectedness. Um, so some, some of the challenges for us as the regulator is, is to no longer concern ourselves and satisfy ourselves necessarily with the quality of a service. We need to look at the, at the people, quality of people's lives, we need to look at good lives rather than good services. And, and the work that we are doing to develop our approach um, over the coming months and, and which we're implementing in terms of how we carry out inspections and how we provide support to organisations that are failing uh, will be very firmly rooted in, in the ambition of the standards. Um, I'll spare you some of the more technical uh, slides, but the shift in our approach as a regulator over the last two years is characterised by, by this slide. So in, in the last couple of years we've tried to move to a position where we're more proportionate in what we do. We look less at services that consistently perform well and spend more time inspecting and supporting those services that are um, delivering poor outcomes. So we've moved away from being an enforcer, a regulator, to thinking about how we can further improvement. 
The focus that we've taken has been much more about outcomes. What difference does this make? The so what question, rather than worrying about processes and, uh, and inputs. And we've sought to develop clearer inspection reports, and we know we're not there yet, but we've got work to do. So from that, we're now moving to a position where the new standards will, will inform our work, um, where we're developing a quality indicator that is about outcomes, um, where we're supporting organisations that are registered to provide care and support to think about self-evaluation and to think about what they do through the, the lens of the, of the care and health standards. And we're also publishing and developing illustrations of our expectations. So what we're doing is we're giving lots of good examples of what a very good service looks like or what a weak service looks like to try to support self-evaluation and, and drive up the standard of, of care. Um, I think I'm about to get so I shall um, not necessarily go through the, re the remainder of, of the presentation, but invite you in the remaining five minutes if you have any questions to ask me uh, about them. Thank you. <laughs> Social work provision needs improvement. Yeah, I think the necessarily speak with any evidence base about, about provision here in Aberdeen. I mean, what I would say is that a part of our scrutiny of local authorities, the partnership work with IGBs, um, and part of the focus of our activity around SDS and um, adult support protection will take us to a number of local authorities across the country. Um, we only might visit five or six or seven or eight in the course of a year. Um, what we would also be doing though is ensuring that we have um, a link inspector who works from our organisation with each of those partnerships to challenge them to identify how they are improving, how they're meeting local needs, how they're commissioning services, how they're carrying out assessments, how they're engaging with, with people who, who, who receive new services uh, and invite them to consistently try to achieve, achieve improvements. I, I mean, it would be wrong for me not to acknowledge the, the significant financial challenges that local authorities are under, um, but that isn't a concern for us in the context of our scrutiny, because what we're looking at is, is the quality of service, the standard of service, the outcomes, the engagement, the, the leadership, the direction. Um, and we don't compensate for the fact that there are problems within uh, the, the finances of local authorities. We don't drop our standards according to that, and we, we do make those demands. 
I'd be at a loss to say very much more in relation to the current situation in Aberdeen, and, and it probably would be um, inappropriate for, for me to do so without an evidence base. But I, I acknowledge what you're saying in relation to uh, the, the dissonance between your experience in, in terms of care and support and the ambition and the standards, and, and we need collectively to try to bridge that gap and, and challenge politicians and, and local authorities to, to step up to what standards demand of them. I'm creeping across it. I was getting a nod from Leslie. She's, she's making me the hatchet person. Thank you very much. Right, no, thank you.